Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. Plutarch's Lives, Volume 2, is now available. In this volume we read of Spartacus, Hannibal, the beginnings of the career of Caesar, and many other ancient Romans and Greeks. It's twenty more hours of some of the richest history ever penned. Go to www.thebestaudiobooks.com today. Shakespeare's Tragedy of Coriolanus is a largely forgotten volume in his canon of work. T.S. Eliot proclaimed it as Shakespeare's greatest achievement, calling it better than Hamlet. Says he, Coriolanus may not be as interesting as Hamlet, but it is Shakespeare's most assured artistic success. And probably more people have thought Hamlet a work of art because they found it interesting than have found it interesting because it is a work of art. It is the Mona Lisa of literature. One of the unique things about the play is that it is 400 years old and most of you listening don't know much about it. Not to worry. Each act, or episode, begins with a detailed summary of the story, taken from the Bard's original source material, Plutarch's Lives. I have also included speech tags so you can always follow who is speaking. The result is a Shakespearean experience like no other. Well, one other. We did Hamlet a couple of years ago. And so without further ado, Coriolanus, Part 1 of 5, by William Shakespeare. Introduction to Coriolanus, Act 1 taken from Plutarch's Life of Coriolanus. Caius Martius, being left an orphan and brought up under the widowhood of his mother, has shown us by experience that although the early loss of a father may be attended with other disadvantages, yet it can hinder none from being either virtuous or eminent in the world, and that it is no obstacle to true goodness and excellence. Those were times at Rome in which that kind of worth was most esteemed, which displayed itself in military achievements, one evidence of which we find in the Latin word for virtue, which is properly equivalent to manly courage. But Martius, having a more passionate inclination than any of that age for feats of war, began at once, from his very childhood, to handle arms. The first time he went out to the wars, being yet a stripling, Martius, while fighting bravely in the dictator's presence, saw a Roman soldier struck down at a little distance, and immediately stepped in and stood before him and slew his assailant. The general, after having gained the victory, crowned him for this act, one of the first, with a garland of oaken branches. Martius was ambitious always to surpass himself, and did nothing, how extraordinary soever, but he thought he was bound to outdo it at the next occasion, and ever desiring to give continual fresh instances of his prowess, he added one exploit to another, and heaped up trophies upon trophies. Of all the numerous wars and conflicts in those days, there was not one from which he returned without laurels and rewards. And whereas others made glory the end of their daring, the end of his glory was his mother's gladness. The delight she took to hear him praised, and to see him crowned, and her weeping for joy in his embraces, rendered him, in his own thoughts, the most honored and most happy person in the world. He took a wife also at her request and wish, and continued, even after he had children, to live still with his mother without parting families. The repute of his integrity and courage had by this time gained him a considerable influence and authority in Rome, when the Senate, favoring the wealthier citizens, began to be at variance with the common people, who made sad complaints of the rigorous and inhuman usage they received from the money-lenders. For such as through former exactions were reduced already to extreme indigence, and had nothing more to be deprived of, these they led away in public services, in numerous campaigns, 
which they undertook upon a promise made by their rich creditors that they would treat them with more gentleness for the future. But when, after they had fought courageously and beaten the enemy, there was nevertheless no moderation or forbearance used, and the Senate also professed to remember nothing of that agreement, and sat without testifying the least concern to see them dragged away like slaves and their goods seized upon as formerly. There began now to be open disorders and dangerous meetings in the city. There had been frequent assemblies of the whole Senate about this difficulty, but without any certain issue. The poor commonalty, therefore, perceiving there was likely to be no redress of their grievances, on a sudden collected in a body, and encouraging each other in their resolution, forsook the city, and sat down by the river Anio, without committing any sort of violence or seditious outrage, but merely exclaiming as they went along that they had this long time past been in fact expelled and excluded from the city by the cruelty of the rich, that Italy would everywhere afford them the benefit of air and water, and a place of burial, which was all they could expect in the city, unless it were perhaps the privilege of being wounded and killed in time of war, for the defence of their creditors. This is where Shakespeare's play begins. The Senate, apprehending the consequences, sent the most moderate and popular men of their own order to treat with them. Menenius. A reconciliation ensued, the Senate acceding to the request of the people for the annual election of five protectors, for those in need of succor, the same that are now called the tribunes of the people. And the first two they pitched upon were Brutus and Sicinius, their leaders in the secession. The city being thus united, the commons stood presently to their arms, and followed their commanders to the war with great alacrity. The Romans were now at war with the Volscian nation, whose principal city was Corioli. In attacking Corioli, Cominius divided his army, marching himself with one body to encounter the Volscians on their approach from without, and leaving Titus Lartius, one of the bravest Romans of his time, to command the other. There was a man of Antium, called Tullus Ophidius, who, for his wealth and bravery and the splendor of his family, had the respect and privilege of a king among the Volscians, but whom Martius knew to have a particular hostility to himself above all other Romans. Frequent menaces and challenges had passed in battle between them, and those exchanges of defiance to which their hot and eager emulation is apt to prompt young soldiers had added private animosity to their national feelings of opposition. Within Corioli, here it was that Martius, flying out with a slender company, obliged the assailants to slacken their speed. Diverse of his own party now rallying and making up to him, the enemies soon retreated. But Martius, not content to see them draw off and retire, pressed hard upon the rear, and drove them to the very gates of their city. A combat ensued, of the most extraordinary description, in which Martius, by strength of hand and swiftness of foot and daring of soul, overpowering every one that he assailed, succeeded in driving the enemy to seek refuge, for the most part in the interior of the town, while the remainder submitted and threw down their arms, thus affording Lartius abundant opportunity to bring in the rest of the Romans with ease and safety. Corioli, being thus surprised and taken, the greater part of the soldiers employed themselves in spoiling and pillaging it, while Martius indignantly reproached them, and exclaimed that it was a dishonorable and unworthy thing when the consul and their fellow citizens had now perhaps encountered the other Volscians and were hazarding their lives in battle. Few paid him any attention. Martius attended Cominius with a small train. Cominius and his soldiers were not a little disturbed by his first appearance, seeing him covered with blood and sweat. But when he hastily made up to the consul with gladness in his looks, recounting to him how the city had been taken, all cried out to be led to battle. The consul granted the request, with much admiration of his gallantry, 
and when the conflict began by the soldiers darting at each other, and Martius sallied out before the rest, the Volscians opposed to him were not able to make head against him. Wherever he fell in, he broke their ranks and made a lane through them. But the parties turning again and enclosing him on each side with their weapons, the consul, who observed the danger he was in, dispatched some of the choicest men he had for his rescue. The Romans forced them at length to abandon their ground and to quit the field, and, going now to prosecute the victory, they besought Martius, tired out with his toils, that he would retire to the camp. He replied, however, that weariness was not for conquerors, and joined with them in the pursuit. The rest of the Volscian army was in like manner defeated, great numbers killed, and no less taken captive. The day after, when Martius, with the rest of the army, presented themselves at the consul's tent, Cominius rose, and, having rendered all due acknowledgments to the gods for the success of that enterprise, turned next to Martius, and first of all delivered the strongest encomium upon his rare exploits. The whole army applauded. Martius, however, stepped forth, and declaring his thankful gratification at the praises of his general, said that all other things, which he could only regard rather as mercenary advantages than any significations of honour, he must waive, and should be content with the ordinary proportion of such rewards. I have only, said he, one special grace to beg, and this I hope you will not deny me. There was a certain hospitable friend of mine among the Volscians, a man of probity and virtue who is become a prisoner, and from former wealth and freedom is now reduced to servitude. Among his many misfortunes, let my intercession redeem him from the one of being sold as a common slave. Such a refusal and such a request on the part of Martius were followed with yet louder acclamations, and he had many more admirers of this generous superiority to avarice than of the bravery he had shown in battle. When the noise of approbation and applause ceased, Cominius, resuming, said, It is idle, fellow soldiers, to force and obtrude those other gifts of ours on one who is unwilling to accept them. Let us therefore give him one of such a kind that he cannot well reject. He shall hereafter be called Coriolanus. And now, Coriolanus by William Shakespeare Act One Scene One Enter a company of mutinous citizens with staves, clubs, and other weapons. The first citizen speaks. Before we proceed any further, hear me speak. Speak, speak, they all say. You are resolved rather to die than to famish. Resolved, resolved, they all say. First, you know Caius Martius is chief enemy to the people. We know it, they all agree. We know it. Let us kill him, and we'll have corn at our own price. Is the verdict? They all agree. No more talking on it. Let it be done. Away! Away! The second citizen speaks. One word, the good citizens. We are accounted poor citizens. The patricians, good, says the first citizen. What authority surfeits on would relieve us. If they would yield us but the superfluity, while it were wholesome, we might guess they relieved us humanely. But they think we are too dear. The leanness that afflicts us, the object of our misery, is as an inventory to particularize their abundance. Our sufferance is a gain to them. Let us revenge this with our pikes, ere we become rakes. For the gods know I speak this in hunger for bread, not in thirst for revenge. Would you proceed especially against Caius Martius? Against him first, they all say. He's a very dog to the commonalty. Consider you what services he has done for his country. Very well, says the first citizen, and could be content to give him good report for it, but that he praise himself with being proud. Nay, but speak not maliciously, they all say. I say unto you, says the first citizen, 
What he hath done famously, he did it to that end. Though soft-conscienced men can be content to say it was for his country, he did it to please his mother, and to be partly proud, which he is, even to the altitude of his virtue. What he cannot help in his nature, the second citizen says, you account a vice in him. You must in no way say he is covetous. If I must not, says the first citizen, I need not be barren of accusations. He hath faults with surplus to tire in repetition. What shouts are these? He hears shouts from within. The other side of the city is risen. Why stay we prating here to the capital? Come, come, they all say. Soft, who comes here? Menenius Agrippa enters. Worthy Menenius Agrippa, says the second citizen, one that hath always loved the people. He is one honest enough, would all the rest were so. What works, my countrymen in hand? Where go you with bats and clubs? The matter, I pray you, says Menenius. The second citizen speaks. Our business is not unknown to the Senate. They have had inkling this fortnight what we intend to do, which now we'll show them in deeds. They say poor suitors have strong breaths. They shall know we have strong arms too. Why, masters, my good friends, mine honest neighbours, will you undo yourselves? says Menenius. We cannot, sir. We are undone already. I tell you, friends, most charitable care have the patricians of you. For your wants, your suffering in this dearth, you may as well strike at the heaven with your staves as lift them against the Roman state, whose course will on the way it takes cracking ten thousand curbs of more strong link asunder than can ever appear in your impediment. For the dearth, the gods, not the patricians, make it, and your knees to them, not arms, must help. Alack, you are transported by calamity thither, where more attends you, and you slander the helms of the state who care for you like fathers, when you curse them as enemies. Care for us, says the second citizen. <laughs> True indeed. Then they are cared for us yet, suffer us to famish, and their storehouses crammed with grain. Make edicts for usury to support usurers, Repeal daily any wholesome act established against the rich, and provide more piercing statutes daily to chain up and restrain the poor. If the wars eat us not up, they will, and there's all the love they bear us. Either you must, says Menenius, confess yourselves wondrous malicious, or be accused of folly. I shall tell you a pretty tale. It may be you have heard it. But since it serves my purpose, I will venture to stale it a little more. Well, I'll hear it, sir, says the second citizen. Yet you must not think to fob our disgrace with a tale, but then please you deliver. There was a time, says Menenius, when all the body's members rebelled against the belly, thus accused it, that only like a gulf did it remain in the midst of the body, idle and unactive, still cupboarding the viand, never bearing like labour with the rest, where the other instruments did see and hear, devise, instruct, walk, feel, and mutually participate, did minister under the appetite and affection common of the whole body. The belly answered, Well, sir, what answer made the belly? says the second citizen. Sir, I shall tell you. With a kind of smile— which now came from the lungs, but even thus. <laughs> well, look you, I may make the belly smile as well as speak. It tauntingly replied to the discontented members, the mutinous parts that envied his receipt, even so most fitly as you malign our senators, for that they are not such as you. Your belly's answer, says the second citizen. What? The kingly crowned head, the vigilant eye, the counsellor heart, the arm our soldier, our steed the leg, the tongue our trumpeter, with other muniments and petty helps in this our fabric, if that they— What then? says Menenius. 
For me this fellow speaks. What then? What then? Should by the cormorant belly be restrained, says the second citizen. Who is the sink of the body? Well, what then? The former agents, if they did complain, what could the belly answer? I will tell you, if you bestow a small, of what you have little, patience a while, you'll hear the belly's answer. You're long about it. Note me this, good friend, says Menenius. Your most grave belly was deliberate, not rash like his accusers, and thus answered. True it is, my incorporate friends, quoth he, that I receive the general food at first which you do live upon. And fit it is, because I am the storehouse and the shop of the whole body. But if you do remember, I send it through the rivers of your blood, even to the court, the heart, to the seat of the brain, and through the cranks and offices of man, the strongest nerves and small inferior veins, from me, receive that natural competency whereby they live. And though that all at once, you, my good friends, this says the belly, mark me, I, sir, well, well, says the second citizen, though all at once you cannot see what I do deliver out to each, yet I can make my audit up that all from me do back receive the flower of all, and leave me but the bran. What say you to that? It was an answer. How apply you this? The senators of Rome, says Menenius, are this good belly, and you the mutinous members. For examine their counsels and their cares, Digest things rightly touching the wheel of the common. You shall find no public benefit which you receive, but it proceeds or comes from them to you, and no way from yourselves. What do you think, you the great toe of this assembly? I the great toe? Why the great toe? For that, being one of the lowest, basest, poorest of this most wise rebellion, thou goest foremost, thou rascal, that art worst in blood to run, leadst first to win some vantage, but make you ready your stiff bats and clubs, Rome and her rats are at the point of battle, their one side must have bail. Caius Martius enters. Hail, noble Martius. Thanks, says Martius. What's the matter, you dissentious rogues, that rubbing the poor itch of your opinion make yourselves scabs? We have ever your good word, says the second citizen. Martius speaks. He that will give good words to thee will flatter beneath abhorring. What would you have, you curs, that like not peace nor war... The one affrights you, the other makes you proud. He that trusts you, where he should find you lions, finds you hares, where foxes, geese, you are no surer, no, than is the coal of fire upon the ice or hailstone in the sun. Your virtue is to make him worthy whose offence subdues him and curse the justice did it. Who deserves greatness, deserves your hate. And your affections are a sick man's appetite. Who desires most that which would increase his evil. He that depends upon your favours, swims with fins of lead. And hews down oaks with rushes. Hang ye! Trust ye! <laughs> with every minute you do change a mind, and call him noble that was now your hate. Him vile that was your garland, what's the matter? That in these several places of the city you cry against the noble senate, who under the gods you keep in awe? Which else would feed on one another? What's their seeking? he asks Menenius. For corn at their own rates, whereof they say the city is well stored. Hang em, says Martius. They say, oh, 
The Hales sit by the fire, and presume to know what's done in the capital. Who's like to rise, who thrives, and who declines? Side factions and give out conjectural marriages, making parties strong and feebling such, as stand not in the liking below their cobbled shoes. They say there's grain enough. With the nobility lay aside their ruth and let me use my sword, I'd make a quarry with thousands of these quartered slaves, as high as I could pick my lance. Nay, says Menenius, these are almost thoroughly persuaded, for though abundantly they lack discretion, yet are they passing cowardly. But I beseech you, what says the other troop? They are dissolved, says Martius. Hang em. They said they were unhungry. Side forth proverbs that hunger broke stone walls, that dogs must eat, that meat was made for mouths, that the gods sent not corn for the rich men only. With these shreds they vented their complainings, which being answered and a petition granted them a strange one to break the heart of generosity and make bold power look pale. They threw their caps as they would hang them on the horns of the moon, shouting their emulation. What is granted them? says Menenius. Five tribunes, says Martius, to defend their vulgar wisdoms, of their own choice. One's Junius Brutus, Sicinius Volutus, and I know not. It's death. The rabble should have first unroofed the city, as so prevailed with me. It will in time win upon power, and throw forth greater themes for insurrections arguing. This is strange, says Menenius. Martius speaks to the citizens. Go. Get you home, you fragments. A messenger hastily enters. Where's Caius Martius? Here, what's the matter? The news is, sir, the Volskis are in arms. I'm glad on it. Then we shall have means to vent our musty superfluity. See, our best elders. Enter Sicinius Volutus, Junius Brutus, Cominius, Titus Lartius, with other senators. The first senator speaks. Martius, tis true that you have lately told us the Volskis are in arms. They have a leader, Tullus Ophidius, says Martius, that will put you to it. I sin in envying his nobility, and were I anything but what I am, I would wish me only he. You have fought together, says Cominius. We were half to half the world by the ears, and he upon my party. I'd revolt to make only my wars with him. He is a lion that I am proud to hunt. Then, worthy Martius, says the first senator, attend upon Cominius to these wars. It is your former promise, says Cominius. Sir, it is, says Martius, and I am constant. Titus Lartius, thou shalt see me once more strike at Tullus's face. What, art thou stiff? Stand'st out? No, Caius Martius, says Lartius. I'll lean upon one crutch and fight with the other, ere stay behind this business. Oh, true bread, says Menenius. Your company to the capital, where I know our greatest friends attend us. Lartius speaks to Comenius. Lead you on, then to Martius. Follow Comenius. We must follow you, right worthy your priority. Noble Martius, hence to your homes be gone. Nay, let them follow, says Martius. The Volskis have much corn. Take these rats thither to gnaw their garners. Worshipful mutineers, your valour puts well forth. Pray, follow. He exits. The citizens all steal away. Zacchinius and Brutus remain behind. Was ever man so proud as this Martius? says Zacchinius. He has no equal, says Brutus. When we were chosen tribunes for the people, marked you his lip and eyes, nay, but his taunts, being moved 
says Brutus. He will not spare to gird the gods. Bemock the modest moon. The present wars devour him. He is grown too proud to be so valiant. Such a nature, tickled with good success, disdains the shadow which he treads on at noon. But I do wonder his insolence can brook to be commanded under Cominius. Fame, says Brutus, at which he aims, in whom already he is well graced, cannot better be held nor more attained than by a place below the first. For what miscarries shall be the general's fault, though he perform to the utmost of a man, and giddy censure will then cry out of Martius, Oh, if he had borne the business! Besides, if things go well, opinion that so sticks on Martius shall of his demerits rob Cominius. Come, says Brutus, half all Cominius's honours are to Martius, though Martius earned them not, and all his faults to Martius shall be honours, though indeed in aught he merit not. Let's hence, says Sicinius, and hear how the dispatch is made, and in what fashion. More than his singularity, he goes upon this present action. Let's along. They both exit. Scene 2 Enter Tullus Ophidius with senators of Coriolis. So your opinion is, Ophidius, says the first senator, that they of Rome are entered in our councils and know how we proceed. Is that not yours? says Ophidius. What ever have been thought on in this state that could be brought to bodily act ere Rome had circumvention? Tis not four days gone since I heard thence. These are the words. I think I have the letter here. Yes, here it is. He reads the letter. They have pressed a power, but it is not known whether for east or west. The dearth is great, the people mutinous, and it is rumoured Cominius, Martius, your old enemy, who is of Rome worse hated than of you, and Titus Lartius, the most valiant Roman, these three lead on this preparation. Whether it is bent, most likely it is for you. Consider of it. The first senator speaks. Our army is in the field. We never yet made doubt but Rome was ready to answer us. Nor did you think it folly to keep your great pretenses veiled, says Ophidius, till when they needs must show themselves, which, in the hatching, it seemed, appeared to Rome. By the discovery, we shall be shortened in our aim, which was to take in many towns ere almost Rome should know we were afoot. Noble Ophidius, says the second senator, take your commission, hie you to your bands, let us alone to guard Cariales. If they set down before us for the remove, eh, bring up your army. But I think you'll find they're not prepared for us. Oh, doubt not that, says Ophidius. I speak from certainties. Nay more, some parcels of their power are forth already, and only hitherward. I leave your honours. If we and Caius Martius chance to meet, tis sworn between us. We shall ever strike till one can do no more. The gods assist you, they all say, and keep your honours safe, says Ophidius. Farewell. 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 Scene 3. Enter Volumnia and Virgilia, mother and wife to Martius. They set them down on two low stools, and so. Volumnia, Marcius's mother, speaks. I pray you, daughter, sing, or express yourself in a more comfortable sort. It, if my son were my husband, I should freely rejoice in that absence wherein he won honour, than in the embracements of his bed where he would show most love. When yet... He was but tender-bodied, and the only son of my womb, when youth with comeliness plucked all gaze his way, 
when for a day of king's entreaties a mother should not sell him an hour from her beholding eye, considering how honour would become such a person, that it was no better than, picture-like, to hang by the wall if renown made it not stir, was pleased to let him seek danger where he was like to find fame. To a cruel war I sent him, from whence he returned, his brows bound with oak. I tell thee, daughter, I sprang not more in joy at first hearing he was a man-child, than now in first seeing he had proved himself a man. But had he died in the business, madam, says Virgilia, how then? Then, says Volumnia, his good report should have been my son. I therein would have found issue. Hear me profess sincerely, had I a dozen sons, each in my love alike, and none less dear than thine and my good Martius, I had rather had eleven die nobly for their country than one voluptuously surfeit out of action. Enter a gentlewoman. Madam, the Lady Valeria is come to see you. Virgilia speaks to Volumnia. Beseech you, give me leave to retire myself. Indeed you shall not, says Volumnia. Methinks I hear hither your husband's drum. See him pluck Ophidius down by the hair, as children from a bear, the Volskys shunning him. Methinks I see him stamp thus and call thus Come on, you cowards! You were got in fear, though you were born in Rome, his bloody brow with his mailed hand then wiping forth he goes, like to a harvest man that's tasked to mow her all or lose his hire. His bloody brow, says Virgilia. Oh, Jupiter, no blood! Away, you fool, says Volumnia. It more becomes a man than guilt his trophy. The breasts of Hecuba, when she did suckle Hector, looked not lovelier than Hector's forehead, when it spit forth blood at Grecian sword, contemning. Tell Valeria, to the gentlewoman, we are fit to bid her welcome. The gentlewoman exits. Heavens bless my lord from fellow Phidias. He'll beat off Phidias's head below his knee and tread upon his neck. Enter Valeria and an usher and a gentlewoman. My ladies both good day to you, says Valeria. Sweet madam, I am glad to see your ladyship. How do you both, says Valeria. You are manifest housekeepers. What are you sewing here? A fine spot in good faith. How does your little son... I thank your ladyship. Well, good madam, says Virgilia. He had rather see the swords and hear a drum than look upon a schoolmaster, says Volumnia. Oh, my word, the father's son, says Valeria. I'll swear it is a very pretty boy. Oh, my troth, I looked upon him a Wednesday half an hour together. He's such a confirmed countenance. I saw him run after a gilded butterfly, and when he caught it... He let it go again, and after it again, and over and over he comes, and up again, catched it again. Or whether his fall enraged him, or how twas, he did so set his teeth and tear it. Oh, I warrant how he mammocked it, one of his father's moods. Indeed, la, tis a noble child. A crack, madam, says Virgilia. Come, says Valeria. Lay aside your stitchery. I must have you play the idle housewife with me this afternoon. No, good madam, says Virgilia. I will not out of doors. Not out of doors? She shall, she shall, says Volumnia. Indeed, no, by your patience, says Virgilia. I'll not over the threshold till my lord return from the wars. Fie, says Valeria. 
"'You can find yourself most unreasonably. "'Come, you must go visit the good lady that lies in. "'I will wish her speedy strength "'and visit her with my prayers,' says Virgilia. "'But I cannot go thither.' "'Why, I pray you,' says Volumnia. "'Tis not to save labour, says Virgilia, "'nor that I want love. "'You would be another Penelope,' says Valeria. "'Yet they say all the yarn she spun in Ulysses's absence "'did but fill Ithaca full of moths. <laughs> "'Come, I would your cambric were sensible as your finger, "'that you might leave pricking it for pity. "'Come, you shall go with us.' "'No, good madam, pardon me, indeed I will not forth. "'In truth, la, go with me,' says Valeria, "'and I'll tell you excellent news of your husband.' "'Oh, good madam, there can be none yet,' says Virgilia. "'Verily, I do not jest with you,' says Valeria. "'There came news from him last night.' "'Indeed, madam, in earnest it's true,' Valeria continues. "'I heard a senator speak it. "'Thus it is, the Volskis have an army forth, "'against whom Cominius the general is gone, "'with one part of our Roman power. "'Your lord and Titus Lartius are set down before their city Coriolis.' "'They nothing doubt prevailing, and to make it brief wars. "'This is true on mine honour, and so I pray go with us.' "'Give me excuse, good madam,' says Virgilia. "'I will obey you in everything hereafter.' "'Let her alone, lady,' says Volumnia. "'As she is now, she will but disease our better mirth.' "'In troth,' says Valeria, "'I think she would. "'Fare you well, then.' Come, good sweet lady, prithee, Virgilia, turn thy solemnness out of door, and go along with us. Not at a word, madam, indeed I must not. I wish you much mirth. Valeria looks at her and replies, Well then, farewell. The ladies exit. Scene 4 Martius and Titus Lartius are before the city of Coriolis. With them is a drum, a trumpeter, and colours, and captains and soldiers, with scaling ladders. Martius speaks to Lartius. Yonder comes news. A wager they have met. My horse to yours, no? Tis done. Agreed. Martius speaks to the messenger. Say, has our general met the enemy? They lie in view, says the messenger, but have not spoke as yet. So the good horse is mine, says Lartius. I'll buy him of you, says Martius. No, I'll nor sell nor give him. Lend you him, I will, for half a hundred years. <laughs> to the trumpeter, he says. Summon the town. How far off lie these armies? Within this mile and half. Then shall we hear their larum and they ours, says Martius. Now, Mars, I prithee make us quick in work that we with smoking swords may march from hence to help our fielded friends. Come, blow thy blast, to the trumpeter. They sound a parley. Two senators enter, with others on the walls of Coriolis. Tell us, Aphidius, is he within your walls? No, says the first senator. Nor a man that fears you less than he, that's lesser than a little. Hark our drums! Drums can be heard far off are bringing forth our youth. We'll break our walls rather than they should pound us up. Our gates, which yet seem shut, we have but pinned with rushes. They'll open of themselves. Hark ye far off. There's an alarm from far off. There is Ophidius. List what work he makes amongst your cloven army. Ah, oh, they are at it, says Martius. Their noise be our instruction, says Lartius. Ladders, ho! They prepare their ladders to assault the walls. Enter an army of the Volskis. They fear us not, says Martius, but issue forth their city. Now put your shields before your hearts, and fight, with hearts more proof than shields. Advance, brave Titus! They do disdain us much beyond our thoughts, which makes me sweat with wrath. Come on, my fellows! He that retires, I'll take him for a Volsky, and he shall feel mine edge. Alarum. The Romans are beat back to their trenches and exit, followed by the Volskis. Enter Martius, cursing. 
all the contagion of the south light on you, you shames of Rome. You heard of boils and plagues, plaster you o'er, that you may be abhorred further than seen, and when infect another against the wind a mile, you souls of geese that bear the shapes of men. How have you run from slaves that apes would beat? Pluto and hell! All hurt behind, backs red, and faces pale with flight and agued fear. Mend, and charge home, or by the fires of heaven I'll leave the foe and make my wars on you! Look to it! Come on! If you'll stand fast, we'll beat them to their wives, as they us to our trenches followed. Another alarum, and Martius follows the Volskis to the gates. So, now the gates are ope. Now prove good seconds. Tis for the followers fortune widens them, not for the flyers. Mark me, and do the like. He enters the gates. Foolhardiness, not I, nor I. The gates close, and Martius is shut in. See, they have shut him in. The alarum continues. To the pot I'll warrant him. Enter Titus Lartius. What has become of Martius? Slain, sir, doubtless. Following the flyers at the very heels, says the first soldier. With them he enters, who, upon the sudden, clapped to their gates. He is himself alone to answer all the city. O oh, noble fellow, says Lartius, who sensibly outdares his senseless sword, and when it bows, stand up. Thou art left, Marcius. A carbuncle entire, as big as thou art, were not so rich a jewel. Thou wast a soldier even to Cato's wish, not fierce and terrible, only in strokes, but with thy grim looks and the thunder-like percussion of thy sounds, thou madest thine enemies shake, as if the world were feverous and did tremble. Martius enters, bleeding, assaulted by the enemy. Look, sir! Oh, tis Martius! Let's fetch him off, or make remain alike! They fight, and all enter the city. Scene 5 Enter certain Romans with spoils. This will I carry to Rome, and I this. I'm a rain on it. I took this for silver. They exit. The battle alarm continues still afar off. Enter Martius and Titus Lartius with a trumpet. Martius speaks. See here, these movers that do prize their honors at a cracked drachma. Cushions, leaden spoons, irons of a doit, doublets that hangmen would bury with those that wore them, these base slaves. Ere yet the fight be done, pack up. Down with them. And hark what noise the general makes. To him, there is the man of my soul's hate, Ophidius, piercing our Romans. Then, valiant Titus, take convenient numbers to make good the city, whilst I, with those that have the spirit, will haste to help Cominius. Worthy sir, thou bleedst, says Lartius. Thy exercise hath been too violent for a second course of fight. Sir, praise me not. My work hath not yet warmed me. Fare you well. The blood I drop is rather physical than dangerous to me. To Ophidius thus will I appear and fight. Now the fair goddess Fortune, says Lartius, fall deep in love with thee, and her great charms misguide thy oppressor's swords. Bold gentleman, prosperity be thy page. Thy friend no less, says Martius, than those she placeth highest. So farewell. Martius exit. Thou worthiest Martius, says Lartius. Go sound thy trumpet in the market-place. Call thither all the officers of the town, where they shall know our mind. Away. He exits. Scene 6 Enter Cominius, as it were, in retire, with soldiers. Breathe you, my friends. Well fought, says Cominius. We are come off like Romans, neither foolish in our stands nor cowardly in retire. 
Believe me, sirs, we shall be charged again. Whiles we have struck by interims and conveying gusts, we have heard the charges of our friends. The Roman gods lead their successes as we wish our own, that both powers, with smiling fronts encountering, may give you thankful sacrifice. Enter a messenger. Thy news? The citizens of Coriolis have issued, and given to Lartius and to Martius battle. I saw our party to their trenches driven, and then I came away. Though thou speakest truth, says Cominius, methinks thou speakest not well. How long is't since? Above an hour, my lord. Tis not a mile. Briefly we heard their drums. How couldst thou in a mile confound an hour, and bring thy news so late? Spies of the Volskis held me in chase, and I was forced to wheel three or four miles about, else had I, sir, half an hour since brought my report. Enter Martius, bleeding. Who's yonder? says Cominius. It does appear as he were flayed. Oh, gods, he has the stamp of Martius, and I have before time seen him thus. Come I too late, says Martius. The shepherd knows not thunder from a tabor, more than I know the sound of Martius' tongue from every meaner man. Come I too late, says Martius. Ay, if you come not in the blood of others, but mantled in your own. Ho, 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 let me clip ye in arms as sound as when I wooed in heart, as merry as when our nuptial day was done and tapers burned to bedward. He embraces Cominius. Flower of warriors, how is't with Titus Lartius? As with a man busied about decrees, condemning some to death and some to exile, ransoming him or pitying, threatening the other, holding Coriolis in the name of Rome, even like a fawning greyhound in the leash, to let him slip at will. But where is that slave which told me that they had beat you to your trenches? Where is he? Call him hither! Let him alone, says Martius. He did inform the truth, but for our gentlemen, oh, the common file, a plague, tribunes for them. The mouse now shunned a cat as they did budge from rascals worse than they. But how prevailed you? asks Cominius. Will the time serve to tell, I do not think. Where is the enemy? Are you lords of the field? If not, why cease you till you are so? Martius, we have at disadvantage fought, and did retire to win our purpose. How lies the battle? asks Martius. Know you on which side they have placed their men of trust? As I guess, Martius, their bands in the vanguard are the entireties of their best trust. Or them, or Phidias, their very heart of hope. I do beseech you, says Martius, by all the battles wherein we have fought, by the blood we have shed together, by the vows we have made to endure friends, that you directly set me against Ophidius and his entieties, and that you not delay the present, but filling the air with swords advanced and darts, we prove this very hour. Though I could wish, says Cominius, that you were conducted to a gentle bath and balms applied to you, yet dare I never deny your asking. Take your choice of those that best can aid your action. Martius turns to the soldiers about him. Those are they that most are willing. If any such be here, as it were sin to doubt, that love this painting wherein you see me smeared, if any fear lesser his person than an ill report, if any think brave death outweighs bad life, and that his country's dearer than himself, let him alone, or so many so minded wave thus to express his disposition and follow Martius. O oh, me alone. They all shout and wave their swords, take him up in their arms and cast up their caps. Make you a sword of me! If these shows be not outward, which of you but is four Volskis? None of you is but able to bear against the great Ophidius a shield as hard as his. A certain number, though thanks to all, 
must I select from all. The rest shall bear the business in some other fight, as cause will be obeyed. Please you to march, and I shall quickly draw out my command, which men are best inclined. March on, my fellows, says Cominius. Make good this ostentation, and you shall divide in all with us. They all exit. Scene 7 Titus Lartius, having set a guard upon Coriolis, going with drum and trumpet toward Cominius and Caius Martius, enters with a lieutenant, other soldiers, and a scout. Titus Lartius speaks to the lieutenant. So, let the ports be guarded. Keep your duties as I have set them down. If I do so, dispatch those centuries to our aid. The rest will serve for a short holding. If we lose the field, we cannot keep the town. Fear not our care, sir, says the lieutenant. Hence, and shut your gates upon us. Our guider, come. To the Roman camp, conduct us. They exit. Scene 8. Alarum, as in battle. Enter Martius and Ophidius at separate doors. Martius speaks first. I'll fight with none but thee, for I do hate thee worse than a promise-breaker. We hate alike, says Ophidius. Not Afric owns a serpent I abhor more than thy fame and envy. Fix thy foot. Let the first budger die the other's slave, and the gods do him after. If I fly, says Ophidius, Martius, hola me like a hare. Within three hours, Tullus, alone I fought in your Coriolis walls, and made what work I pleased. Tis not my blood wherein thou seest me masked, for thy revenge wrench up thy power to the highest. Wert thou the Hector, replies Ophidius. That was the whip of your bragged progeny. Thou shouldst not scape me here. Here they fight, and certain Volskis come in to the aid of Ophidius. Martius fights till they be driven in breathless. Officious, oh, and not valiant, you have shamed me in your condemned seconds. The Volskis drag Ophidius off. Scene 9 The sounds of battle still rage all around us. Finally, a retreat is sounded. At one door, Cominius enters with the Romans. At another door, Martius enters with his arm in a sling. Cominius speaks. If I should tell thee o'er this day's work, thou'dst not believe thy deeds. But I'll report it where senators shall mingle tears with smiles, where great patricians shall attend and shrug in the end admire, where ladies shall be frighted and gladly quaked hear more, where the dull tribunes that with the fusty plebeians hate thine honours shall say— Against their hearts, we thank the gods our Rome hath such a soldier. Yet camest thou to a morsel of this feast, having fully dined before. Enter Titus Lartius with his power from the pursuit. O oh, general, he says, here is the steed, we the comparison. Hast thou beheld? Pray now no more, says Martius. My mother— who has a charter to extol her blood, when she does praise me, grieves me. I have done as you have done. That's what I can. Induced as you have been, that's for my country. He that has but effected his good will hath ordained mine act. You shall not be the grave of your deserving, says Cominius. Rome must know the value of her own, to wear a concealment worse than a theft— no less than a traducement to hide your doings, and to silence that which, to the spire and top of praises vouched, would seem but modest. Therefore I beseech you, in sign of what you are, not to reward what you have done before our army hear me. I have some wounds upon me, 
says Martius, and they smart to hear themselves remembered. Should they nod, says Cominius, well might they fester against ingratitude and tent themselves with death. Of all the horses, whereof we have taken good and good store, of all the treasure in this field achieved and city, we render you the tenth to be taken forth before the common distribution at your only choice. I thank you, General, says Martius, but cannot make my heart consent to take a bribe to pay my sword. I do refuse it, and stand upon my common part with those that have beheld the doing. A long fanfare, all cry, Martius, Martius! They cast up their caps and lances. Cominius and Lartius stand bare. Martius continues, May these same instruments which you profane never sound more, when drums and trumpets shall in the field prove flatterers, let courts and cities be made all of false-faced soothing. When steel grows soft as the parasite's silk, let him be made an overture for the wars. No more, I say, or that I have not washed my nose that bled or foiled some debile wretch, which without note... Here's many else have done you. You shout me forth in acclamations hyperbolical, as if I loved my little should be dieted in praises sauced with lies. Too modest are you, says Cominius, more cruel to your good report than grateful to us that give you truly. By your patience, if against yourself you be incensed, We'll put you like one that means his proper harm in manacles, then reason safely with you. Therefore be it known, as to us, to all the world, that Caius Martius wears this war's garland, in token of the which my noble steed, known to the camp, I give him, with all his trim belonging. And from this time— for what he did before Coriolis, call him, with all the applause and clamour of the host, Martius, Caius, Coriolanus, bear the addition nobly ever. Fanfare and trumpet sound and drums, all cry, Martius, Caius, Coriolanus. I will go wash, says Coriolanus to Cominius. And when my face is fair, you shall perceive whether I blush or no. Howbeit I thank you. I mean to stride your steed, and at all times to undercrest your good addition to the fairness of my power. So to our tent, says Cominius, where, ere we do repose us, we will write to Rome of our success. You, Titus Lartius, must to Coriolis back. Send us to Rome the best— with whom we may articulate for their own good and ours. I shall, my lord, says Lartius. The gods begin to mock me, says Coriolanus. I, that now refused most princely gifts, am bound to beg of my lord general. Take it, tis yours. What is it? I sometime lay here in Coriolis, says Coriolanus, at a poor man's house. He used me kindly. He cried to me. I saw him prisoner. But then Ophidius was within my view, and wrath o'erwhelmed my pity. I request you to give my poor host freedom. Oh, well begged! Were he the butcher of my son, he should be freed as is the wind. Deliver him, Titus! Martius his name? By Jupiter. <laughs> Forgot. I am weary. Eh, my memory is tired. Have we no wine here? Go we to our tent, says Cominius. The blood upon your visage dries. It is time it should be looked to. Come. Scene 10 The Fanfare with Cordance Enter Tullus Ophidius, bloody, with two or three soldiers. Ophidius speaks. The tone has taken. 
will be delivered back on good condition. Condition? I would, I would a Roman, for I cannot, being a Volsky, be that I am condition. What good condition can a treaty find in the part that is at mercy? Five times, Martius, I have fought with thee. So often hast thou beat me, and wouldst thou do so, I think, should we encounter as often as we eat. By the elements, if ever again I meet him beard to beard, he is mine, or I am his. Mine emulation hath not that honour in it had. For were I thought to crush him in an equal force, true sword to sword, I'll potch at him some way, or wrath, or craft may get him. He's the devil, bolder, though not so subtle. My valour is poisoned with only suffering stain by him, for him shall fly out of itself, nor sleep, nor sanctuary, being naked, sick, nor fain, nor capital, the prayers of priests, nor times of sacrifice. Embarkments all of fury shall lift up their rotten privilege and custom against my head. To Martius, where I find him, were it at home, upon my brother's guard, even there, against the hospitable cannon, where I wash my fierce hand in his heart. Go ye to the city, learn how tis held, and what they are that must be hostages for Rome. Will you not go? asks the soldier. Aye. I am attended at the Cypress Grove, replies Ophidius. I pray you, tis south, the city mills. Bring me word thither how the world goes, that to the pace of it I may spur on my journey. I shall, sir. The soldier exits, and Ophidius is left alone. <laughs> This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of Coriolanus, Part 1 of 5 by William Shakespeare. If your company is creating a video or creating a commercial, I'd love to do your voiceover work. Please drop me a line at voiceover at thebestaudiobooks.com. In a day or two, I can deliver a superior voiceover project at a very competitive price. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories the world has ever known.